Real Estate 101 with Boyle Team Real Estate. All right, welcome everybody to the first episode of the business and investing series of the Real Estate 101 podcast. Uh, Very excited for this series. We're going to have Jason here today from Mortgage Intelligence. So very excited to have you. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Colson. I appreciate it. Uh, Again, uh, hello everyone. I'm Jason Comina from Mortgage Intelligence with the DN Mortgage Team, Mortgage Broker, Mortgage Agent. Alrighty, well, let's get started. Before we go ahead with this, I'm just going to do a little breakdown of what we're doing. We have the buyer series, the seller series, and the business and investing series in our podcast. And we're going to be talking to different business owners on the business series, business and investing series. And we're going to be talking to different people who are in the investing and business game overall. So get their story, get their background, get our best advice from them. And from the sellers and buyers standpoint, it's going to be more of a people looking to sell real estate, kind of like a learning log for them. And also on the buyer side, the same thing, more of a learning log for them. So to get started, Jason, uh, tell us a little bit about your story. Where are you from? What do you do? How did you get to where you are? Give me the whole rundown. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> do we have that much time here? Uh, <laughs> Geez, uh, mortgage agent now, uh, but started off, I uh, grew up in Cambridge, born in Toronto, um, but grew up in Cambridge. Uh, my parents were, my dad was with Unirail Goodrich and my mom worked for Bell Canada. So, you know, uh, regular folks. And uh, once we were in Cambridge, I went to elementary, high school. And then after that, uh, went into uh, Home Depot and worked at Home Depot. So I liked always uh, the fact that you know, the DUI, DIY uh, yep. type stuff, but um, ended up falling into the to the real estate market because I kind of loved it. So I started uh, with the associates slash city financial doing like 20% loans, um, and, you know, just small cash money loans and so forth, which cool. 20% <laughs> is, is crazy uh, or even sometimes higher than that. So uh, loan shark in, 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 in a sense. Uh, but I got the the idea of credit and the five C's of credit. Um, so collateral, capital, um, credit, um, you know, capacity, and so forth. So when I figured that uh, grand scheme of uh, of uh, the financial industry, I managed to get over to MCAP, MCAP Mortgage Corporation, which is uh, a big lender out here in in, in North in Canada or Ontario. Um, from there, I uh, started being an underwriter and did underwriting, underwriting mortgages and whatnot. So I was in the, the mortgage industry from very early in the early 2000s. And then from there, I was working two jobs, Home Depot and, and the, the financial sector. Um, and then I managed to get into CIBC where I was uh, there for also, well, I was at MCAP for seven years and then we ended up getting laid off yep. over there because of the 2008 crunch. Mm. If you guys remember that recession, in that time so i was laid off from work there um then went to cibc i found that job um, and stayed with them for about 11 years so it was an underwriter mortgage underwriter there so i have like about at least 19 years in the business um and being at cibc kind of was my uh, stepstone for understanding a lot more about mortgages um so you see every walk of life and i used to cater to pretty much all the brokers or mortgage advisors nationally um, for CIBC. Um, and then with, with that being said, you were seeing all kinds of different, different applications and different clients um, when these brokers would send it in. And I was like, I wanna be on that side of the fence um, in front of the actual client rather than being at the cubicle and approving and declining. So I just kind of moved my way up the ladder from there. Um, from being an underwriter then in two years or almost three years actually with um, with CIBC, I became a mortgage advisor. And then now I was in front of an actual client and, yep. and talking to real estate agents like yourself. Yeah. And then uh, that was that. And then I decided to go on my own um, and under uh, the DN mortgage team or under the mortgage intelligence umbrella. Yep. And uh, been doing, uh, doing that for the last four years, yeah. Awesome, always good to go on your own. Lots of opportunity out there. and. Yeah, it was, a, it was a much better. You know, you have that that uh, 
that actual freedom to kind of spread your wings. Yeah, right? you're not in this uh, in the cubicle anymore. So the yeah, walls exactly. Not, the walls are not so closed in, or yeah. you're not just a one trick pony. Yeah. So now I have like a, a a plethora of lenders, maybe fifty to a to to more lenders that I could actually work with to cater to my clients. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and like we were saying before, the ceiling is endless there, but also mm -hmm. the floor is endless. So it's kind of something where it's upon you to make make yourself accountable for yourself and yeah. run the ship the way you want to run it. Yes, I definitely run the show. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So that great rundown on that story, like tons of experience there. You got a plethora of knowledge in the industry. So that's great to hear. And yeah. any stories along the way that you want to share, like any, what's like any like creative stories in the investment side of things, like lending out to an investor, anything like that, any, any creative finance or anything that comes across your mind? Well, again, with the investors, you got it when they're coming to my, ta my table or, or we sit down and we have a, have a quick chat, you, you, you more or less want to vet, vet the, that investor and um, what their credentials are and what they're looking after. So you can you basically find out their wish list. Right. Exactly. Um, so, and then after that, then I can create or make some suggestions as to where where to move forward. Are you pulling out? Are you do you have capital yourself? Do you have cash under the mattress uh, yeah. to invest in your in, in your property, or do you have to go and do you have properties right now that you can pull out some cash or pull out some some, some funds to purchase again or to again mom the bank of mom and dad yeah. is always there right? yeah so totally there's all so there's a whole it's with every client's a different uh a different uh scenario right to oh yeah how to vet and uh dissect so you gotta ask them and listen for sure um, so listen to what their needs are and then you just kind of work from there um but i again every deal is a, is a different deal or you know just another day to figure yeah. it out yeah what was, you got any tough, tough deals that was very hard to pull through, but you did get it. Is there anything like that? Any, where you had to pull some creative financing or private money or something? Okay. Well, well, any like, well, I do have private lenders under my belt. Um, again, I'm working on right now, uh, true North cannabis, okay. um, which is a big, uh, a big, one of the top five in, in Canada or, or, or in Ontario rather. Um, so I'm working on that and uh, that one's my most challenging um, again because who wants to lend on cannabis right yeah so that's you definitely tough. have to go through a lot of I had to go through a lot of my resources to figure that one out um, still working on it um, but it's looking fruitful at the end of the day but um, creative stuff is more or less like <clears throat> hey mr. mr. lender or, or mr. 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 and mrs. client do you want this house all right these are the the challenges your credit score is low and I'll figure out how to repair okay. that credit. So I'll give them like, you know, like, you know, sometimes a client will come to me today and we don't get them a house for the next three years because we're, we're, we're kind of coaching them along the way. Yeah. So coaching means one being credit bureau, um, it's slow, some, some old collection. So we had to kind of massage that and give them an understanding of what they had to do to pay off from credit cards or or pay down some credit cards or pay off a credit, uh, you know, a collection and so forth to bring the credit score into where a bank or yep. a lender would, uh, would love to entertain their, their financing. Um, of course. Other, other stuff would be the down payment because sometimes people are, are, uh, are using mom and dad for, for instance, for a down payment. So I would have to kind of coach them on the, 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 the down payment on what documents the lender or the bank would need or the challenging stuff, what's the most challenging? Because most of the clients that I deal with are, are definitely clients that are salaried. Yeah. So it's just a job letter and a pay stub, or you know, if they are, you need maybe two years um, T4s to kind of gross up their income because they do some overtime. Um, but then the hardest ones are self-employed folks. Yes, right? for sure. Which is a whole conversation that we can have as well. Totally. So massaging or trying to, it's just a matter of getting an understanding of uh, what their needs are and telling them what they need to do because everybody thinks they can buy the house today but there's so many behind the scenes stuff yep. that I have to work on or, or, or articulate to them so that they can understand the process. Yeah. And um, sometimes it's a matter of finding them a down payment through private money if they don't have it there or sometimes it's as 
simple but it's complicated at the yep. same time as fixing up that credit score yep. which is a huge yep. thing the banks look at if or you, you want tell to them to go back to the drawing board and, and save some more money and yeah come exactly back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah develop or a little the, plan with them or you develop the plan get them to go and get the RS use an rsp idea um and go to the bank and see what they can do in terms of uh and, and, and getting the rsp and so yeah. forth yeah exactly so to kind of keep it directed towards more the real estate investing side, what do you have any specific products that you use or s like sell for real estate investors who are maybe looking for like their first property? Any type of mortgage that you would well, try to put them in or any type of lender? Okay, yeah. Well, I, again, I worked for um, for MCAP once upon yep. a time, so. I do have relationships there and I do have relationships with ICICI or just different lenders that I, I normally work with. Um, I used to use work for the bank. So you find me kind of not being biased, but I'll still send my clients to a bank, but there's so many other real estate, uh, sorry, other lenders that are out there that have the same product as yeah. some of these banks. So uh, for- someone, Sometimes better even too. Yeah, yeah. And the same rates, same, same policies and same guidelines. Um, uh, so for me, when I, when I would, uh, you know, send my clients or work on my clients that are first time home buyers, for instance, I would just, I would literally show them the different, the different rates or the different products for, uh, for instance, if someone's purchasing a, a home right now in today's market or even whichever market, um, there's a purchase plus improvement product, Yep. right? So the purchase plus improvement product is how that works is. You've gone into this house, you, you love the house, but the kitchen needs some, some <laughs> yeah. work, right? Or exactly. the flooring in the kitchen needs some work or, or, or whatever have you. So I would say maybe let's use a, a Purchase Plus product. What the Purchase Plus improvement product is, you can get a contractor to come into your property or, you know, and, and give you an invoice for your kitchen to do perhaps maybe ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 worth of work in the kitchen. You have to pay that up front out of your pocket but with the purchase plus improvement the lender will say yeah if you do this kitchen it'll raise the value up from this property to xyz so you can qualify for more so you can qualify for more so that being said now the value of the property is is more because you you've put interest in doing the kitchen so what lenders do is usually do about 20 percent of whatever the purchase price is that you bought the house for at that point but you got to still come up with that money up yep. front. So when you come up with that money up front, you get your, your contractor to finish the job. You got about 120 days to complete that job. Yep. But that extra funds that the lender approved you for, for the purchase plus improvement, whether it be 20 to 40, yeah. 20 or lesser of 40,000, the, the money sitting at the lawyer's office in trust to pay you back. Yep. So you get that money back after at the end of the day. Yep. Or purchase, purchase plus. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just one of the products that yeah. I would perhaps put uh, a client in. Which could be good for investment because you could buy something that's needs some work, put money into it. Yeah. You're raising the the bar. You're yeah. You're raising the bar of the what the rents are going to go for. You're mm -hmm. adding equity to the home instantly and the bank's essentially lending you money to do that right. on top, right? Right. And you're increasing your, what you qualify for you're if you're a first time yeah. buyer. Other than that, um, other stuff that you would, again, for, for more aggressive investors is a variable rate. Um, variable rate doesn't look as uh, enticing or as delicious as we, uh, as we used to see it, but it will come back, please the Lord. Um, <laughs> but uh, again, for more aggressive investors, that are buying rental properties or, or, or stuff or homes that they're they're going to hold for a couple of years and and maybe sell and, and go into something else um, with a variable rate now it, it's better to use than a fixed because if, with a fixed rate you're going to have to pay a penalty yep that penalty will be three months principal um, and three months interest so that with these rates right now that could be a with some of these homes, that could be about twenty something thousand dollars yeah. in penalty, versus uh, the variable rate where it's only three months. Yep, three months interest in penalty. So that would be much more nominal yeah. if you have to break your mortgage yeah. to move on to you know because you got to spend money to make money. 
Um, so you would break your mortgage that way with a variable rate. So stuff like that, well, I, I would, I would uh, kind of as a seed planted in in my mm-hmm. investors. Yeah. Years. and and in the sense where you are getting a fixed rate now, the best thing about it is you know and you have that confidence that you're going to be able to make those payments you're basically locked in right but if it does go down and it's going to be very tempting to try to get out of that because hey i can pay 500 less bucks a month so then you might have to go over the numbers and see does that twenty thousand dollars or x number penalty make sense yeah over the long term or should i keep my 20 grand and wait till the term's up right yeah 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 so at that point those are some key stuff because again you know like the old school like to be conservative and know their payment with a fixed payment you're paying this every month da, 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 da. but you know with a variable rate with this market it fluctuates all right yeah so, so that's totally. you, you got to worry about that but there is savings with a with a, with a variable rate when you're coming to a when you're an investor coming in totally so i have a question about lending money against a home that's producing income already and ones that have potential to produce income. So something that's maybe like a two unit dwelling Mm -hmm. where you want to rent out both the units, but say, I guess the case could be, it could be rented out now, but it also could be rented, not rented out yet, but potentially be rented out. Do you guys have any programs for that? Um, Potentially being rented out again with, with those stuff. um, If I understand your correction, your, your question correctly, um, potentially being rented out if you have a, you have to retrofit your basement. Okay. But right? let's say, it's say for example, it's already a legal two unit dwelling. Okay. So, and you're looking to buy it. What will the bank lend on that? Well, the bank will, they have, you have to put about 20% down okay. for something like that. Right. So if you're purchasing a rental property and you you know, you're going to be getting income from upstairs or downstairs, normally the banks want 20% down payment okay. of that value. Um, and then in turn, um, you, we we got to find out what the fair market rents for the yes. property is too. So there's appraisal done. Yep. Um, and then appraisal will come and give you a fair market rent uh, um, evaluation or estimate of what that, what that income would be for that home. Um, versus somebody that is bought a new shell of a home and needs to fix it, fix it up. At that point, you can go to have like a separate entrance. You have to have windows. Uh, a certain size, so yeah. the fire retrofit would be yeah, exactly. Place and, there, and because there is a lot of people out there right now that are not doing, you know, the the putting insurance on this home. Yeah. So that if you actually someone downstairs in the basement floods your basement and it's not retrofit, you're not gonna, you know, yeah, the basement floods or something like that. You're not getting your money back. Yeah, you better so, have a capital so account saved up. <laughs> yeah. So that that being said, um, you know there. For potential buyers, you, there's certain criteria that you have to meet. And again, we can go over all that when you call our group. And yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. And then, so what, what can somebody do who's watching this right now, to, who's looking to start getting into investing? What can they do to improve their chances of qualifying for the most money? Would you say, I know buying something that already has tenants in it is good because they already can prove the income. And yeah. Banks will lend you more money if it has income because it's directly going back to you, right? Um, what's something that they can do to increase their chance of getting a better number for a qualification standpoint? So, well, it, it, again, it, go, it boils down to the five C's of credit. Yeah. Again, right? So it's always, you know, cash rules, obviously. Yep. Um, so down payment is, is key. So you'd probably increase your down payment. So again, go to the bank of mom and dad. Um, uh, RSP and so forth to add to your to your buying power to bring down that bring down that uh, mortgage purchase price yep. so that you can actually have a lower payment perhaps at the end of the day. Um, so for other for people coming in again, uh, is credit. Uh, so credit is is key is golden. So you so whatever your credit score is is fine. But what does the credit history look like? Yeah. So are you maxed out in credit cards? Are you maxed out in in, in loans and so forth? You just got a fresh car loan. Yeah. So perhaps don't go get a car loan when you're trying to buy, buy a property. Yeah. All right? Because it could be like five, six hundred dollar mortgage payment. I'm sorry, um, car mm-hmm. loan payment. But now that is taken away from your debt servicing. Yeah. So, 
So it's just keeping keeping the debts low, having them at least 50 to 35 to 50 percent um, utilization. So utilization is key, um, so that you keep your debt servicing ratios down. Um, any collections that you've had from maybe Fido or or, uh, yeah. or Rogers yeah. or Bell or something like that, you got to kind of see if you can make sure those are paid off. Even though you, perhaps you weren't at fault, you've yep. paid off that account, but there was still some interest dollars on it. So just go pay it off and so, and perhaps get a letter from them saying that it's paid off yeah. and so forth. So yeah, there's there's a, a, a just a list of variables yep. um, to tell clients. Again, if you have a part-time job, um, but you have to have a part-time job for two years. So if you have your full-time job and then you have a part-time job, perhaps you could use that for uh, for your, your additional income. Yep. We could use child tax benefit um, so if you have a couple of kids that are under, under the age of 15, um, under the age of 15, and you can use your child tax benefit for your income. Um, so that is something that you could add. Uh, what else? Um, geez, I can go down long, the long, long list of stuff long list with, with every different client. Yeah. So again, that would be just something that you would uh, have a chat but, with. Yeah. Overall, just keep your debt like in control and don't get your debt to service ratio too crazy. Yeah, and, and car loans and so forth. Yeah. Like hold out on that car until after yeah. perhaps you purchase the house. Even, exactly. Even yeah. though that car needs to take you to that job that you work at to, yeah. to make that money, to pay off those debts or to you know increase yeah. your down payment. But um, at the end of the day- um, There's alternatives there's to getting alternatives. a new car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, and another thing I want to touch on, lots of people grow their portfolios in real estate investing by buying one property, copy and pasting it to the next one by pulling equity out of that and putting yep. it into another property. Yep. What do you have input on for pulling that equity out, putting it into another property? What's your best way to do it? What different programs can you use to do that? Uh, well, it, it's well. Once the client gives me a shout and we go through the wish list of what they're trying to trying to to do um, in terms of pulling out equity from their current home, I definitely have to do a whole set of numbers. So I would do the numbers on. Okay, you can pull out about one hundred and twenty thousand okay. as a number. Do you, do you like them fully leveraging out all their money though? Is that it's the best way, yeah. Right, rather than going under your mattress or going to your bank and pulling out uh, your your Canada Savings bonds, or yeah, stuff like that. Use 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 the money out of your home. Yeah, that's the best way. And then what do you what do you say to a client who's looking to take a hundred? Say they have a hundred and fifty grand. Say they're taking out all eighty percent of what the bank's letting them take out to put into another place. Do you think that's a risk taken that? could go sour very quickly or do you think them taking out all that money and holding a little bit of that money in the safety net to well, back yeah. them up is a good idea yeah if you, when you pull out all that money you don't i i, I try to stay in and make sure people stay in their lane yeah right? exactly like I, i'm not telling them okay we'll take all the money out take and dump on the next yeah. home and you don't have any kind of cushion behind yeah you exactly. if you lose your if your renter um cannot pay for the next couple of months. Yeah. So yeah, so take out the 120, keep 10, 50, yeah. 20,000 dollars for yourself so that just in case you know, yeah. um, you know, something of this recession that we're going through or covid happens and you're not working as much, you have that safety net to take care of those mortgage yeah. payments. But again, we make sure that the debt service ratios are in line. Yep. Right? When I'm saying, yes, you can go buy this property at this price, so I don't make sure I don't. We don't go over the ledge, yeah, at, at, at all. When totally. You're, when you're doing those numbers, and I think that safety net is so important. Like everyone who's looking to buy in real estate investments, I think you should have a certain percentage of what you're getting paid from your tenant per month mm -hmm. put away to a safety net account. So, say you buy a new build property, and average roof maybe lasts anywhere from ten to twenty. To 30 years, mm -hmm. 30 years down the line, you're gonna have an account built up and it's gonna pay for itself to replace the roof and replace yeah. the windows. And it just builds up over time. Well, that's know, just it. Like when I'm, doing, low, low when, risk I'm account. when I'm doing my numbers and I give them, uh, my clients a breakdown of, okay, well, this is, you gotta pay the closing costs. You gotta pay title insurance. You gotta pay um, your mortgage payment. Um, 
plus your property taxes. I, we still don't really factor in the utilities. Oh, yeah. Stuff, right? So based on utilities being your Enbridge gas, your, your, your Hydro One bill coming in after the fact. So I make sure that the ratios, the debt service ratios, try to keep them a little bit under so that perhaps at the end of the week you can afford a case of beer or that, yeah, glass, yeah. Or that glass of wine that you'd like to take out <laughs> yeah. on, a, on a Friday evening. Right? Exactly. So I do make sure I, I try to keep my clients um, in their lane, right? Yeah. Especially, you know, there's, you, there's always the what ifs. Yeah, because being over leveraged can be very scary, especially in a downturning market or something where we're kind of experienced right now where the interest rates have shot up. If you're on a variable and you were already maxed out, oh, like, gosh. that's tough. And from a, a standpoint where you're looking at the income on your investment property, if it goes up a thousand bucks a month on a variable and you are only cash flowing a thousand bucks a month, that's your whole margins gone right there. Yeah, and just that, washed away. And again, a lot of clients that I have um, enjoyed the fruits of uh, of the variable rate. So that, but now that we've gone through this whole uh, economic global mashup, if you want to call it <laughs> yeah. that, um, <laughs> there's clients that that are probably paying now uh, an extra fifteen thousand. Yeah. To fifteen hundred dollars, um, and wanting to lock in, but yeah. I'm telling them see if we could hold tight a little bit. Yep. So any of my clients that perhaps might be watching this, or clients uh, of, of other mortgage agents that are watching this, um, I'm still saying hold tight um, with the, the the rates that are going on right now because please the Lord they should come down um, perhaps by the end of the year once the the Ukraine and the Russian war slow you know kind yeah. of softens up and. And the, a little bit of the inflation, we've seen gas prices go down a little bit as well. Yep. So we're just waiting for the, the correction of the market to, yeah. to come, so that so that these variable rates and so forth can can subside a little bit. We'll probably never see the the two percent rates and the one percent uh, some things that we used to see in the last year and a half or or, or so. That but was crazy. It's <laughs> nuts, but um, definitely bananas. But um, it, it will come back down um, again. It's. It's not as, uh, this, this one's a little bit more vicious than the 2008 uh, yep. recession, but um, we're, we're, they're doing the right things to, to correct it. Yeah, totally. And what kind of measures do you see the, the lenders and the banks doing to kind of ease themselves from getting crunched during this time? Right, well, we've already seen the first pause um, last month with the Bank of Canada rate, yep. right? So that was uh, that was this March. The next one's coming out, I believe it's April 8th or April Yeah, 12th. Early, early April. Early April, first couple of weeks of April. Um, so we're hoping for another pause again. Or uh, even a or, drop. Or even a, perhaps a quarter drop. But, um, but other than that, we will be seeing, uh, please Lord, we will be seeing some. I don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> yeah. Because if I had a crystal, sure I a crystal ball, I would be in Hawaii. I'm <laughs> so smart, <laughs> right? But um, definitely, uh, we'll we'll see these uh, these rates coming down a little bit to to assist with um, not pinching some of these yeah. folks out of their homes. Yeah, and what do you think? From honest, I know, I know inflation kind of goes hand in hand with the interest rates. Mm -hmm. And what do you think? Yeah, they brought them up, and it's kind of got a little bit of a lag effect, taking the interest or taking the inflation back down. Do you think them dropping the interest rates again because they might have to because of the way the bond market is performing? Do you think that that'll push inflation back up? What's your speculation on that? Well, I'm not really much of a bond guy. You probably <laughs> can tell me more about <laughs> the bonds and so forth. Um, but again, with them bringing bringing the uh, the inflation down a little bit we should see a little bit of a decrease in the in you know a little bit more play yeah with with the rates um now it's very hard to to approve a lot of a lot of folks with these rates um it's just simply too high and pay, mortgage payments are just crazy yeah through the roof. it's tough um so that being said they so which will make the, our, our Toronto market just lose out with, yeah. uh, on some of these purchases. And then with this, uh, the whole Russian war and, and whatnot in the Ukraine, um, 
you're going to have a lot of folks coming in because yeah. they're, they're saying like three to five hundred thousand people. Yeah, and half I think, a million people coming into to Canada. Yeah, and I think that's going to have a huge impact and drive the inflation up too. Because right, because where are you going to put all these people? Yeah. And we don't, and, and they're not, and and they're not working. Right? Yeah. So now they we got to find them jobs and whatnot. So we don't have the supply and demand. Well, we have the demand. We don't have the supply that we need to right. fulfill the demand right now. Anyways, right. so we're just again, it is. It's a a good couple of years of uncertainty from yeah. for for a lot of us. Um, again, I, I, you know, I, I I hold respect to everybody fighting through everything yeah. right now and, and keeping that uh, that same mind um, with the COVID and whatnot, and now on to on to, to inflation and whatnot. So there's got to be a calm after the storm. Exactly, I agree. So. And I think the people who are out there who are actually who've been cash flowing or just not quite over leveraged i think they'll be totally fine through everything i i think if you have some positive cash flow it's going to be a smooth ship worst case i think you might come close to breaking even but i don't think it'll crush or run through your whole portfolio no no because right? again you know the real real estate runs runs the runs uh, the world yeah uh, i agree you know uh, so that being said once you have once you're a homeowner, you're playing the game of Monopoly, okay, right? Totally. You know, you pass go, you collect small, measly 200, but once you pass go, you still have you know, Baltic, you still have Park Avenue, you still have <laughs> the end of Illinois off of the Monopoly <laughs> board, right? So that you can collect your rent from, or at that point, what's happening now, you're finding a lot of people selling properties as well. Yeah. Um, well, how are you finding that portion of the market now with, uh, with folks selling and whatnot? I mean, from there is some people who've been caught in the, kind of caught red-handed. They kind of bought at the high of the market, right? And they just, their mortgage payments have gone up. And I think we're going to see it happen a little bit more over the next few months as I think they've tried to tolerate it for as long as they can, mm -hmm. hoping for a change in the market. But it's really affected their the people don't budget for a thousand dollar increase on your uh, mortgage payment a month, and when they're already maxed out there when they first bought the place, they're they're gonna struggle, right? And some people are gonna have to sell, and that could do one of two things: like mm -hmm. that could force them to foreclose, or it can force a lot of people to sell their house and bring back that supply we need on the market to fulfill our demand. But if you look at it from another standpoint, from supply and demand, they're going to want to downsize still and buy another house if they can, if they sell that house early enough where they don't have to pay too much right. out of pocket, right? So then they're going to come down to the lower market where there's already a ton of buyers there who are looking and battling. And we, I seen a property with 32 offers on it the other day. Yeah, so you're seeing it's, that bid yeah. war back again because yeah. it did get soft for a little yeah. bit, right? Right, right. So, well, the, the bid wars, yeah, I do have a few clients out there right now that are, you know, they're priced in this one area of the market. Um, I gave them their, their pre-approval. So, guys, if you're looking for a pre-approval, I'm your guy, <laughs> right, to, to make sure you, you, you can walk with your chest high when you're going out with perhaps Colson um, exactly. or, Mar or Marlene uh, or with your real estate agent. Um, make sure you have your pre-approval and I'll do those numbers up for you so that you do have your held, your, you know, your chest high. I'm like, okay, Jason said I could afford this amount. That's important. Don't go over. Uh, you, you can go under definitely if you find something under, but don't go over that purchase price because that's, that's your maximum. And that's but, important, especially when looking at it from an investment standpoint, when you're, when you you can't afford to be losing too much because it's it's expensive to pay. Say you already have a home, it's expensive to pay another mortgage, and that can yeah. make or break you. Yeah, yeah. So for those investors, yeah, make sure you come over and I get those that pre approval for you. But um, for the most part, it is it has been a, a, a tough situation where you have these clients that are looking for that next property but they want this. Yeah. So sometimes you just got to come back in your lane and perhaps get this because the market yeah. will correct itself. The values of these properties will go up um, again because I know they've softened up a little bit as totally. you noticed a little bit. Totally. Why? By how much? About um, 30, 40, 50, yeah. 100,000 or no? Yeah, and it's kind of different. It kind of varies. The lower end homes haven't came down a whole lot. Okay. The higher end prices 
have came down quite a bit. So you're okay. better off to actually upgrade in this market because in this market, okay. Because well, the lower homes, the six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollar homes, there's a lot of first time homes. There's a big pool of buyers out there, tons of demand for mm -hmm. it still. But once you start getting over that 900, over a million mark, then you kind of, it slows down a bit and we're seeing things going under asking. Okay. We're, we're seeing the, the buyer have the leverage in the deal. Yeah. And it's, it's great when you're actually looking for homes with your clients because you get a little bit of an extra jump on things. You, you can go see a property twice. You can put in a home inspection. Yeah. You got like tons of leverage when you're trying to put an offer in. And the thing I think right now, if somebody's looking to upgrade their home anyways, even investment property as well is good. Yeah. But you sell for your home for 850 six months ago, it's probably gonna come down around the close to eight now. But that mm -hmm. the higher end home that was 1.5, that's came down to 1.1, 1.2. I know. So that I know. that spread there is huge. That's crazy. And that's some of the people that bought for like 1.6. Ex so it's exactly. enormous. And the house was not even worth that. So then exactly. when I'm doing appraisals now for people that are folks that are looking or trying to sell their property for this amount, and they have these 32 buyers come in to try and purchase and, and overbought, it's been tough for even those folks to sell because they're like, well, oh, I, I sold it for 1.6, yeah, but now it's, it's only 1.1. 1. 1. And like, yeah, it's... So it's been, a, that's hence the reason why we're at where, where we're at right now. Yeah. We're just waiting for them to correct to correct all of that. Yeah. But it's good to see that there's there's buyers out there. It's just now are you got you uh, Bank of Canada and you you mortgage gods come down <laughs> yeah, come yeah, down so we can you know so we can assist um, the folks in our communities a, a lot more different um, in the aspect of the interest rate. So it's a little bit more affordable. I'm not asking for one percent rates again. <laughs> yeah. We're just asking for you to come down so we could we could assist, especially if we're going to be bringing in a lot of these folks from, yeah. from different walks of life, from especially the Ukraine and whatnot. Yeah, and that'll and, boost the real yeah, estate so market we, up like crazy. Yeah, so we want these builders to be building and so exactly. lower the inflation so that we can get these these construction guys back on the field a little bit more yeah. versus the, the hot commodity prices that they're selling. For I don't know if you do a lot of financing for builders or anything. Do you know if they have any incentives or any programs for them to get a discount of rate or construction loans? Um, I don't, I never really dabbled in that yeah. too much with the builder, the builder loans and so forth. I did work with Treasure Hill Homes out here in Bowmanville for a good while. And that was when I was with CIBC. Yeah. Um, so I definitely had, uh, I had pretty much that whole community of purchase agreements. Yeah. Purchase and sale agreements. So I, it was a good run with um, assisting folks getting into uh, their properties from, from Treasure Hill and Bowmanville yeah. here. Um, but that they did have the, but I still gave them, still ran them out to a better rate versus the building yeah. because you don't know when these, these mortgage were closing because it sometimes yeah. a builder wouldn't close for another one or two years. Yeah. So the rates could be different at that point. And so on, the, on the builder stand, I'm sorry to cut you off, there, yeah, really. but on the builder standpoint, um, for them looking for financing, cause I know we all know that they don't all have plethora of cash just sitting there that they pay for all these homes with. They run off the deposits that they get to build up a capital account. Oh, for instance, and they also run off construction loans too that kind of covers the whole development. I don't know if they have any, it'd be nice if they had some sort of incentive or uh, like a rate discount to kind of get the, well, the demand or the supply back up there. Well, for you, for, for clients for residential, you can definitely negotiate with your builder for client yep. your clients uh, on that for appliances, you know, twelve foot yeah. ceilings or fifteen foot ceilings and so forth. But when it comes to maybe a builder coming to me, yeah, you'll have to come to me for it and we'll go on the commercial side. Yeah. Again, as what I'm doing for for True North Cannabis. So yeah, yeah and, and some of the other commercial projects that I've worked on. But uh, yeah, the builder would have to come to me and yeah. and we would sit down and I could figure out some alternatives yeah. in the commercial world. Yeah, so um, there's there's things so, out there. You know, to get just kind of something to think of, right? Because yeah. it's a big problem right now, the, the supply. Like it's, yeah. It is. The fact that we have no supply is holding the market together, I think. <laughs> it's the glue. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, so if it, again, every scenario is different, but uh, if you, they definitely want to come and see me on, in the commercial land for business uh, 
to, for business advice, I do have, uh, you know, some folks under my belt. Awesome. To, to chat that's, that's awesome. And that's a whole different ball game, like from what we do here, but it's, yeah. it's a, it's a cre- it's a lot of money to be made, especially if you're looking to invest in real estate as well. And the, in the development side, that's a lot of opportunity there. So we, we like to uh, end our podcast off with two uh, big questions that we'll ask you. We ask the same questions to everybody. So the first question is, do you recommend any any movie, any type of media towards oh, wow. like real estate investing, anything to do with your career, mortgages, first time home buyers, anything that we kind of talked about today? It could be a movie, show, podcast, oh, book. Do you read? Oh my god! You had gosh. to pick one. I know it's I'm tough. I'm a right? big book reader. I'm reading the Scotty Pippen book right now. Yeah. Uh, but I was like, God, he's Pippen, such a hater from Michael Jordan. <laughs> um, so I've I've only read like the first two chapters. I'm like, wow, he really didn't like Mike. <laughs> but um, geez, for books and so forth, I'm not much of a reader. Um, most of the reading that I do uh, is the the little newsletters that come into me in the morning. Oh yeah. Um, for you know, for mortgages. Yep. Um, but that's kind of like my own personal stuff. Yep. And then, if you want to come at me to to, to hear about the, that knowledge and gain that knowledge, because it's just so many different uh, different I, uh, italics that come through that um, in that channel. But for books, gosh, no, I, I don't really have movies. I watch a lot of movies, but my movies are more like reality TV entertainment. Or, yeah, right? for my entertainment, my little you know my little outlet when I uh, when I stop work or I have to go yeah. and deal with the family, right? Yep. And so. it doesn't have to be a book where it's directly related to investing. It could be a book where it teaches a good lesson lesson that would apply to investing or business or any life. Okay. Well, the um, one book is uh, the Power of Intention. Okay. Um, that was by uh, Wayne Dyer or. Wayne Dyer, I believe his name is, okay. so Power of Intention, just to, to go for it. Um, and then there's another book, uh, which is uh, the Cardone guy. Uh, Grant Cardone. Uh, yeah. yeah, he's awesome. So he has, uh, <laughs> he has that one, but the 10 times rule. Okay. Um, so again, it's, it's just a repetitively doing what you do. 10 um, acts, right? <laughs> yeah. So just do it tenfold. Um, do what you do. Uh, repetitively, repetitively, so that you're actually good at it at that point. Yep. But you're also being um, probably not maybe a nuisance to some people because because <laughs> you're doing it ten times. You're yeah. calling them every day and like, how you doing? Can I get business or yeah. or can I uh, can I get a loan? Can yep. I get a mortgage? Can exactly. I get a commercial? You know, right? Or do I need to get a private mortgage? So yep. that that book's a great book in terms of um, being persistent and. Uh, and doing it over and yeah, you know, and over, ex- execute, hustle, and yeah. grind um, is, is the motto. And I think persistency is in the business world is probably the biggest thing. Like one of the biggest things. It's huge. You got to yeah. be persistent, and you got to be accountable for what you're doing, and yeah. stay on the same track, and believe in what you are what putting out there. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just uh, being good for your clients, uh, and, and hopefully, you know, your client at the end of the day um, understands what you're tr- trying to achieve, and they understand that you have the interest in them to for them to grow exactly to grow their generation exactly wealth, right. Um, and that's what we're all here for is to take care of our family and our friends. Exactly. Um, whether it be if you're a real estate investor or you're buying your first home or me assisting you with your mortgage or you assisting them with buying or purchasing a property. So we're just all here to yeah. just kind of work together. And it's, uh, it's, been, it's been a joy to, to assist the many clients yeah. that I have. So yeah, that, you know, that's the brunt of some of the books that I've read. Okay. Um, so that's it for that question. I like, I like the 10X book. That's great. Yeah. Um, the persistency is key, yeah. obviously. And the last question I'm going to ask you is, this is a huge one because oh gosh, <laughs> people can answer this so many different ways. But the question is, what piece of advice would you give to somebody who's just probably listening to this podcast, just starting out and wants to think about open opening up their own business or start investing in something like what's your biggest piece of advice you give to them well again um ask your questions knowledge yep. is the power right okay. um, so again like you said read some books right yep. find uh find uh, that good book 
um, that rich, poor, rich dad, poor yeah. dad book or something like that. But um, my advice is to just ask, a, you know, call up your, your mortgage advisor. Call up your, your, your real estate agent. Take action, right? Yeah, so that you can start, you know, jotting down some bulletin points. On, on how to, to get to that, yeah. understand that process, and then trust the process, yeah. right? Um, because you're gonna have to, your nose is gonna run. Your, your yeah. nose is gonna bleed to understand all of this stuff, <laughs> and it's gonna be a little bit overwhelming. Yep. Don't get discouraged, um, but go, and go, to your, go to your folks in your community. Yeah. Um, you know, don't go and listen to your friends, but um, good advice from your friends, but to come to us professionals, such as uh, yourself, and myself to uh, get an understanding of all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. And then after that, you'll have, you know, some of the pieces yeah. to the puzzle and knowing is half the battle. And yeah. then once you're there, then at that point you can start to execute. Yeah. And you, you basically touched on the fact that they need to educate themselves is the biggest thing first, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And education is great, but it has to be paired with action to yeah. succeed. Yeah. Action is huge. Yeah, and so I, I think that's a great great piece of advice for somebody and I, I think you can't go wrong with ed educating yourself and taking action i think you yeah. you'll be very successful and lots of people have built big businesses on doing that so absolutely absolutely all righty we're gonna wrap this thing up here thanks a lot jason jason for coming out to our podcast today it was a pleasure having you on the show thank you and we will hopefully have you on some point in the future i'm sure we will so this is again episode one uh, look out for our next episodes of the business and investing series. We're going to, we're going to be running that here. Usually like one, once a month, maybe twice a month, we'll be putting up a show. You can find us on uh, Spotify, Apple music, and YouTube. So thanks again for watching and everybody hope you all have a great day. See you later. All the best. Thank you. Thanks for having me.